Good morning. We'll hear a few words from Minister Nate Horner, and then we'll open up to question and answers afterwards. I'll leave it to Minister. Sure. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to present Alberta's results for the fiscal year end, ending March 31st, 2023. Our fiscal update today is a positive one. It is an indication of the progress we've made in securing Alberta's finances. I'm happy to tell you that for the second consecutive year, we balanced the budget and are reporting a surplus. But first, I want to provide a bit of context. The numbers I will discuss today are for the 2022-2023 fiscal year. Over that time, we saw some of the most extreme energy market volatility, along with geopolitical events that created global instability and uncertainty. The war in Ukraine added to supply pressures, and in June 2022, oil prices spiked, reaching over $120 US per barrel, eventually averaging $89.69 over the course of the fiscal year. That's $19.69 higher than our budget 2022 projection of 70 US dollars per barrel. All of this impacted Alberta by increasing revenue, but also reminded us of the need to build long-term sustainability so our finances can be less sensitive to changes in circumstances beyond our control and so future generations can prosper. This year's results position us to allocate sizable amounts of money towards paying down debt and building savings for the future while continuing to support the needs of today. Moving on to the numbers, which provide some perspective on what truly was a remarkable year for our province. Over the fiscal year, we brought in $76.1 billion in revenue, and expense for the year was $64.5 billion, which means we ended the year with an $11.6 billion surplus, $11.1 billion more than we estimated in Budget 2022, and $1.2 billion more than our updated projections in the third quarter. As you might recall, we recently legislated a new fiscal framework that outlines how government is to use any surplus from the budget. While that only recently came into effect and will first apply to the current fiscal year, our priorities remain the same. Our improved situation as of last year is allowing us to pay down substantial amounts of debt, reducing the burden on future generations and is ensuring more money can be put toward vital programs and services in the years and decades ahead. Paying down debt also helps reduce our debt servicing costs, which for 2022-2023 alone were $2.8 billion. We continued to put money in the Alberta Heritage Savings Trust Fund, which I'll speak about further in a moment. Record levels of revenue due to higher oil prices and this government's solid fiscal management have brought our finances back into the black after years of deficits which is why we're able to take these important measures while still increasing our capacity to support Albertans and their evolving needs. When we look back over the past fiscal year, there are several key factors that contributed to our record high revenue and which set the stage for the largest surplus in the province's history. Our revenue intake of $76.1 billion was $13.5 billion higher than we estimated in budget 2022. The key drivers were high non-renewable resource revenue of $25.2 billion and $26.5 billion in tax revenue. The latter point is important, considering we achieved it while successfully lowering the cost of living and doing business in our province. On top of eliminating the provincial fuel tax for a large part of the year, we also indexed personal income tax to match inflation, allowing Albertans to keep more of their hard-earned dollars in their pockets. Neither of these programs incurred any expense and both were reflected as a reduction in revenue. Importantly, we also brought in $8.2 billion in corporate income tax revenue. That's the highest amount of corporate income tax revenue this province has ever generated in a single fiscal year. In addition to the impact of higher oil prices, this is a testament to our low tax, business friendly environment, which is encouraging investment and diversification and creating new jobs by the thousands. It's important to note that we generated our record amount of corporate income tax revenue with the lowest corporate income tax rate in the country, 30% lower than the next lowest province. While there are several factors that impact CIT revenue, this demonstrates that lower taxes mean more economic activity. 
and it speaks to the importance of maintaining a low tax environment. We intend to secure Alberta's significant tax advantage through legislation this fall and we'll provide further details on that initiative in the coming months. In the meantime, we made a record investment in Alberta's health system in 2022-2023, expanding access with additional ICU beds and increased care for mental health and addiction. We invested in every stage of learning, ensuring quality K-12 education for our youth and building on our world-class post-secondary environment. We also made sure Albertans were able to benefit from the province's improved fiscal situation through the electricity rebate, the fuel tax relief programs, and relief payments. Along with other initiatives that lessen the financial burden on Albertans during a time of high inflation. We spent $5.6 billion on our capital plan in 22-23, helping to support economic growth and development. Alberta's provincial highway networks make it possible to efficiently move goods and people throughout the province. Not only does our capital plan fund the maintenance of this critical infrastructure, it creates good jobs that attract skilled workers to our vibrant communities. And to support those people and communities, our capital plan funds the building and upgrading of schools, hospitals, and other facilities essential to Albertans' quality of life. While we recognize Alberta's fiscal strength now, it's important that we prepare for potential uncertainty in the future. Building the Alberta Heritage Savings Trust Fund is one way we're doing just that. And I'm pleased to report that the Heritage Fund continues to grow. In 22-23, the Heritage Fund grew by $2.5 billion from the previous year, attaining a market value of $21.2 billion at the end of the fiscal year. The year-over-year -year change was primarily due to actions taken by the Alberta government. First, we took steps to amend the Alberta Heritage Savings Trust Fund Act, passed by the Legislative Assembly earlier this year. These changes allow all investment income generated by the fund to be retained within the fund, instead of being transferred to general revenue. As a result, $1.25 billion of investment income from the 21-22 year was retained within the fund along with our additional deposit of $753 million. Simply put, the Heritage Fund is Alberta's long-term savings account, and we're committed to growing it for the benefit of all Albertans. As we mark these positive results today, we do so with cautious optimism as we acquaint ourselves with some of the new realities in our province and in our world. While today our focus is on looking back, it's important to acknowledge that these results position Alberta for, an inc for increased prosperity and opportunity moving forward. Rest assured that Alberta's government will remain committed to fiscal discipline as mandated through our new fiscal framework. We'll, we'll do so while ensuring Albertans continue to pay the lowest overall taxes in the country and while retaining our position as the engine of growth for Canada and building on our reputation as one of the most business-friendly jurisdictions in all of North America. We'll also continue to make sure Albertans have access to the supports they need when and where they need them. In closing, today's results show one of the most positive fiscal years in our province's history. Thanks to this government's sound fiscal oversight and ability to responsibly manage historically high revenues, Alberta's finances are back to being in surplus. Our economy is continuing to diversify as we outpace our provincial counterparts in everything from job growth to interprovincial migration. Banks, forecasters, and economists are predicting Alberta will lead the nation in economic growth over the next two years. Our own budget 2023 forecast shows the same. We know there are risks in the economy, high interest rates, high inflation, and global geopolitical uncertainty among them, but there is much to be optimistic about in our province, and today's results speak to that. And they affirm that our commitment to strong fiscal management is working. So thank you very much, and I'd now be happy to take any questions. So we'll now move on to the Q&A portion. So we'll do one question, one follow-up. Um, we'll start in the room. Um, there's a mic to your left there. And then we'll go to those on the phone. Um, before you begin, um, just please identify yourself and your outlet. With that, um, we'll go to the first question here, Kelly. Kelly Kreiderman, Globe and Mail. I'm wondering, I know this is a look back at the last fiscal year, but... We have WTI at under $70 a barrel right now. Are you worried about volatility in this current fiscal year? And are you worried that our budgeting system, you know, needs to smooth out some of those, uh, what has been a really chaotic energy market this year and last year? 
Uh, great question. I, I don't think you can have this job and, and not worry about things like the price of oil. As my deputy minister said, uh, she wakes up in the middle of the night and looks at it some days. But I would say that we, uh, we're, we're confident in, in our plan, in the fiscal framework moving forward, that we have a, a plan to uh, increase our, our expenditures in an appropriate way, way with CPI plus population growth and that we can manage, manage our, our uh, non-renewable revenue in the best way that we can. And that's, that's through accurate forecasting, at which you will see in the first quarter fiscal report. Uh, it, it, may, it may have to come down, but I would say we had a strong handoff uh, in, in a lot of our uh, tax revenue, which you'll have to wait till the end of August to see, but we're, we're, not, as, we're not as worried as, uh, as you may think. And there's a lot of sensitivities beyond just the price of WTI. There's obviously the rate of the currency, uh, where the differential sits. Uh, the di di differential, for example, has been very helpful to us in this first quarter, which you will see uh, at the end of August. Did you follow up? Your predecessor, Travis Taves, promised for a lot of his tenure to take a look at the revenue side of things as well. You talk about sustainability. Is that something that you will be looking at as finance minister? I know in conversations with Minister Taves, I know it was one of his uh, main regrets that he, he wasn't able to, um, to move on a, a full revenue review. Uh, that being said, I've, I've been here a few weeks and haven't even received my mandate letter, so it's probably a conversation that... Uh, need to have with the, the Premier first, but I think it's a sound idea and a great conversation that Albertans should be a part of. Hi, Minister Elise Von Schiel with CBC. You mentioned that influx of migration to Alberta. How do you see that changing the fiscal picture over the next year? Because as we know, they come and they pay taxes, but they also need more services. Sure. No, a great question, Elise. I think it'll, there's definitely a balance there. We'll, we'll see it in our, in our personal income tax revenues. We also expect that we will we will feel it in the services required throughout this fiscal year and, and those into the future. Uh, but also, it's important to understand that that is answering one of the main needs of the provinces uh, the province has right now, which is labor. So there's there's some good and some bad. Um, but if you're going to be a low tax uh, province, you have to be a pro growth province. So we're gonna we're gonna deal with it as it as it comes. In answer to Kelly's question, you said maybe the province isn't as worried as we might think about the price of oil. It, it was all over the map last year. You know, the, the $11 billion increase over what we expected to see maybe compared to the last budget in royalties uh, is hardly a rounding error. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pretty big um, difference. So why aren't you worried, especially given policies we might see from the federal government and the things we might expect from the markets in the next couple of years? I guess I would say, just to clarify, I'm always worried, like wake up in the middle of the night worried, just like my deputy <laughs> minister. But I would just say that the, the forecasted price, that's over the course of the fiscal year. So we're only in the very early days, the end of, end of the first quarter. Uh, and a lot of the optimism was always built into the back half of the year around the price of oil. And that optimism still exists. So while, while it may look daunting right now, we, uh, we're trying to, trying to be patient, and uh, I hope all of Albertans can be patient for the first quarter fiscal update. Hi there, Michael King, uh, Global News. When expenditures are tied to CPI and to inflation, there's still concerns among some industries, especially when we're talking education, that Alberta will continue to lag behind when it comes to per capita spending. They need that kind of one-time top-up to get up to Canadian averages. What sort of flexibility will there be to enable those spending top-ups to try and match with uh, provincial averages? Well, I would say that something that's important to understand um, in the fiscal framework is that that, um, that rule, the CPI uh, plus population growth, um, growth ceiling it does it does adjust every year but that's for our spending as a whole so individual ministries that have more pressure may spend more than others but that's something we'll have to average out as as we sit around treasury board and and look at where the pressures are coming from and can you just elaborate a little bit more when you look at uh you say you're worried about the price of oil and there's an important need to go through and diversify what sort of plans are, are we expecting in the next uh, in the next year here well, I, I think you'd see it's happening. Uh, sometimes it's hard to tell because the, the, 
the numbers uh, from oil and gas are so significant, but you're seeing right now the most diversified economy Alberta's ever seen, and it's happening in tech, uh, agri-food investment, film and television. Uh, it, it, is, it is happening, and uh, those things will continue to pay us dividends into the future. Great, thanks. We'll, with that, we'll go to the phones. Um, operator puts you the first caller. David Staples, Edmonton Journal. Hi, Minister. Um, so we, we are seeing uh, very high levels of uh, immigration and migration to Alberta. What are the pros and the cons uh, in terms of uh, the Alberta economy for this kind of um, movement to the province? Uh, thank you, David. Um, there's definitely some pros and cons. We're, overall, we're very pleased to see it. Uh, but I would say that it, it will put pressure on, on our services and our expenditure side going forward. But it, it is answering one of, one of the main needs of Alberta uh, today, and that is the labor market. Um, everything from, from housing to, to other pieces of construction, you would see uh, in this, in this uh, annual report, we weren't able to complete uh, all of the capital spend as, as we, would have, we would have hoped. Some of that is the capacity of the labor market. So this population surge hopefully is a p part of an answer to that. Uh, but it also will definitely serve us well on the personal income tax side. Um, but it, it does come with uh, spending pressures for sure. Did you have a follow-up, David? Yeah. In the United States, we see a trend where uh, people are leaving Democratic Democrat states for Republican states where the economy is freer and they're more able to uh, conduct business. Do you think the same dynamic, are we seeing the same dynamic here in Canada, with Alberta, being in the place of the, um, you know, the uh, Republican states where the rules are more friendly to business? Well, I would say uh, maybe leaving partisan politics out of it, I would say um, Alberta is proud to be a pro-growth jurisdiction. And if you're going to be a low-tax jurisdiction and remind you that we're uh, the lowest tax jurisdiction other than six states uh, in all of North America, you, you have to be you have to be a pro have a pro growth mindset, so I hope that those people come here to to seek that opportunity that they're not finding elsewhere, and uh, you know through through their efforts and labor, um, you know we're going to see uh, a growth in uh, every every sector of our economy, and that's that's what we're shooting for. Great operator, can you put through the next caller? Catherine Skowski, Alberta Today. Morning, Minister. So. I hear you saying that the overall budget will be capped um, at CPI plus population growth, um, but I also hear you're talking about growing the tax advantage. Um, as, as you mentioned, oil revenues are, well, the price of oil is dropping. So what what's going to give here? Where are, are you going to need to cut somewhere? I, I just I just don't understand the math on that. Well, one, once again, this today is about the annual report, you know, the year that ended March 31st, 2023. And you're going to have to be patient. Uh, I know it's tough, uh, but we'll, we'll have more to say at the end of August with the first quarter fiscal report. Um, but like I said, it's not just the price of oil. There's many sensitivity factors uh, that, uh, that can make a big difference with that number. And like I said, there's been a strong handoff uh, on all the other parts of the economy. So um, I, I know it's tough, but please, uh, please be patient with me. I'm trying to. And you have a follow-up, Catherine? Yeah, and, and so when you're talking about reducing that reliance on uh, sensitive revenues that are beyond your control, we're, we're also hearing from the Premier that the oil and gas industry will not be phased out. So what is the long-term plan here? You had mentioned tech, agri-food, other sectors, but what, what is the long-term plan if we're not phasing out oil and gas. When well, we're, de we're, we're definitely not phasing out oil and gas. And I think even if, if you read um, mm -hmm. articles out as recent as today, you know, even, even moving towards um, a carbon neutral 2050 economy doesn't mean the phase out of oil and gas. And I think Alberta's well position will be producing uh, right, right to the end of, of, of oil's uh, useful life. We'll be one of the last jurisdictions producing that last barrel. And just because demand is potentially less, that doesn't mean price will necessarily be lower either. So there's lots of things to consider as we move forward, but the best part about being a 
a low tax pro growth jurisdiction is that you don't need to pick winners and losers. We have very few instances where we have uh, specific, specific tax credits uh, to target a specific type of growth. Uh, we brought one out last year um, for agri-food value added investment. Um, that's an area that's uh, you know highly highly sought after by neighboring jurisdictions. We have the film and television tax credit, uh, which has done some amazing things for the province and builds on a lot of our natural strengths. And we have uh, the APIP, the Alberta Petrochemical uh, Incentive Program, which is. Uh, provide so much benefit, especially when you work in the royalty side, but also playing to our strengths. A lot of the growth in the industrial heartland is due to it. So we're going to stay a, a low tax, broad, um, broad based economy. And Alberta is going to grow in, in all of these sectors as it already is. Great operator. Can you put through the next caller? Graham Thompson, the star. Yeah, thank you. Just to, um, for just to confirm something to make the picture, picture is clear, as Kelly pointed out, um, I know you're talking about the last fiscal year, but you have mentioned looking ahead, you're not as worried as um, we may think you are. But looking at something you talked about, if the price of oil is $10 below the projected price for this, this current year, are you saying that, that can be counterbalanced by the exchange rate? between us and the U.S. dollar. So even if we're getting less money from oil than anticipated, we'll make that up because of the exchange rate. Uh, there's a few factors in there, Graham. Uh, the exchange rate is one. The other is the forecast to differential. Uh, but these that's very volatile as well. The differential was at about $11 yesterday, and it's about at 14 today. Uh, but for every... For every dollar you're out over the course of the year on the differential, that means that means six hundred million dollars to the fisc. Much like um, every every dollar of WTI you're out means six hundred and thirty million. Every cent you're out on the exchange rate means four hundred and ninety million. Um, so that's that's the magnitude of these sensitivities and the the differential. While we've been below on WTI, the differential's been in our favor for a lot of this first quarter. Um, but again, I have to ask everyone to be patient and and uh, and and wait for the first quarter fiscal at the end of August. Graham, a quick follow up. Yeah. Okay. A quick follow up. <laughs> um, just wondering on this idea of a review of revenue. That's something you, you mentioned today, and of course, uh, Travis Taves talked about that in the past. Would that review include everything, all revenues, including taxes and potentially a provincial sales tax? Like I said, I, I haven't even received my mandate letter, Graham. I, all I know is that I, did, I have had conversations with Minister Taves, and it was one of his regrets. And I think it's always a sound conversation that we should be having with Albertans. I think there's a lot of merit to it. So what all it would entail, that will be a conversation for another day. Uh, operator, can you put through the next caller? Emmanuel Prince, Radio Canada. Yeah, yeah, that was... My question is on the fuel tax freeze. Um, the report says that it saved Albertans $850 million, but it costs the province $1.1 billion. So there's like a 250 mil gap between the benefits that it saves Albertans and the cost to the province. Where did this money go? Uh, I think it's just a discrepancy in numbers, sir. We'll, uh, I can have the department answer that. Uh, more fully, but there isn't the three hundred million dollar difference. the the entire The entirety of the savings is passed on to the is passed on to the consumer. Did you want to follow up? Okay. Yep. And uh, about oil price volatility, you talk about like responsible fiscal management and working on the revenue side. But do you commit in any way on not cutting spending? Do I commit to any way in not cutting spending? Like. Like cutting spending in healthcare, cutting spending in education to make the the budget balance the next budget. Oh, I I would just say we're 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 in very early days. We we haven't even f finished the the first quarter. Uh, the first quarter quarter is generally an anomaly. Um, that's that's what my department tells me. So we're gonna we're gonna walk towards this, not run, and be patient. And like I said, a lot of that optimism is built in the back half of the year. Um, but we have you know we have. Fiscal rules in place for a reason, uh, because we're we're serious about them. So I, I think that's uh, 
that's our pledge to Albertans that we're, we're serious because we know our revenue side is so volatile. We know that our spending side needs to be consistent and the, the growth that needs to be built within it needs to be uh, very steady and very defensible with CPI plus population growth. Great, we have time for one more question. I'll end in the room with Kelly. Okay, you talk about the revenue side being so volatile, but a key campaign promise from your party is introducing legislation that would force a plebiscite if you want to increase taxes. How restrictive is that going to be for you, and are you going to be in charge of introducing that legislation? Uh, the expectation is that, uh, yes, I will introduce Bill 1, um, but I think it's, once again, it's a, it's, a pledge, it's a pledge to Alberta and the province that we're serious about managing Alberta's finances. You know, that's, that's, why we brought in, that's why we brought in the fiscal rules. We didn't bring them in to handcuff some future government. We brought them in to handcuff ourselves, to show, to show Albertans that, um, you know, we understand we have a volatile uh, revenue source and we need very thoughtful, uh, defensible uh, spending, spending rules and, and guardrails. And, you know, you talk about Alberta's advantage, and part of that Alberta advantage has been affordable housing. We are seeing a severe erosion of that, especially in Calgary. Is that something your government plans to address in any significant way? Well, I think, I think housing is a front of mind for many levels of government, and I think you will see policies from our government that, uh, that, that look to move the needle. I, w I would say, look, we had an Alberta's calling campaign. We, we knew it was an advantage. We also were very short of labor. So we, we used those things to our advantage to try to entice people to come and make a life here uh, in Alberta. So every, everything, has, everything has a balance and a, and a cost and effect, but I think overall it's, it's, a, it's a great, great news story. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy that we are going to get to have conversations and deal with all the problems associated with being a, a pro-growth province. Great, thanks, Minister. We got to just ask a question about your family name. You know, of course, you come from a very famous Western Canadian uh, family, and you are becoming finance minister ten years after your cousin was finance minister, your grandfather, your great grandfather. What What are your reflections on that? On Horner continuing a Horner continuing to be involved in Alberta politics? Well, my dad would tell you I should have known enough to stay out of it. <laughs> But I'd, I'd say, uh, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a noble endeavor. And, uh, um, you know, if you, if you look at it that way, I think you, you want to try to do your best for your fellow Albertans. And uh, that's, that's the way I was brought up. So uh, proud to be a part of it. And, yeah, Cousin Doug's, um, he's on speed dial, as is Travis and Shirley McClellan. So we have, I have a lot of former finance ministers uh, in my phone that I can lean on if need be. And... Yeah, I just told Doug I was going to do a better job, so he he, <laughs> he snickered. But uh, no, it's a it's a nice legacy. I'm I'm proud to be part of it. Just want to do a good job. Great, thanks, Minister. That's all the time we have for today. Okay, thank you all.